Good morning. We welcome you here this Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, all sorts of things going on in the church this week. I hope that you will take uh, the opportunity to be part of everything that is going on. Uh, Thursday, we will have a Monday Thursday service here in the sanctuary. Uh, Friday, there will be a Good Friday service over at St. Martin's uh, Lutheran Church down the street. Uh, and of course, we will have uh, uh, Easter Sunday services here uh, one week from today. And uh, expect to see lots of faces uh, that are visitors and those that we see during that time of the year few other things to point out. I know you know what I mean. <laughs> My language, we call them creasters. We see them at Christmas and Easter. Creasters. Anyway, a um, few other things to note. Uh, big, b the biggest event that is taking place this week is uh, uh, as community of churches, we are getting together and doing prayer walks at the various schools um, as part of our witness of faith in the face of uh, the various threats of violence that have taken place in our schools. Uh, if you will note in the uh, letter down at the bottom of the page, we have added Stryker's date. Uh, Stryker will be uh, Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, Archibald is Wednesday at 7 p.m. Hilltop is Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pettisville is next week. Uh, Wasion is on board, and they will be getting us a date very soon. Delta is on board, but they're going to be doing it a little bit differently, and we'll have more details as that gets fleshed out. Uh, we have uh, connections with Brian, Montpelier. Uh, we're reaching out to Napoleon and to Nora. Uh, we should be connecting with all of our schools in the near future, and we will continue to give you all the information as we go. Uh, when you arrive, um, we're making plans for most places to start at the flagpole, and then um, further instructions will be uh, at the high school flagpole, I should say, uh, and further instru instructions will be given out at that point, uh, particularly for like here in Archibald, where we have multiple buildings, um, and then, uh, based on what we are permitted to do, uh, we will move forward and you can expect to be there for 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, Stryker is a difference. Stryker, they're meeting in the high school commons area uh, at 6.30. Um, there will be cards handed out. The cards have some things to consider as you walk through the buildings and you uh, do your prayer walk. and. Uh, we expect there to be good turnout at each of these locations. You're more than welcome to pick any one of them to show up. Uh, I know uh, April talked to the kids at The Rock this past uh, couple of Fridays, and the Pettisville kids are really excited about coming and praying with the Archibald kids. The Archibald kids are really excited about going and praying with the Pettisville kids. And those kinds of witnesses and being part of that should be what we are all about proving that we are, first and foremost, the whole body of Christ. Um, I have one person that has uh, decided to take me up on my pastor's day away, uh, which is an important spiritual retreat. <laughs> Carlin and I are looking for two more people to join us for this uh, uh, great monastic adventure. Uh, and uh, if you have the time and the interest in participating, let me know, uh, and we will add you to our list. There are certainly many other things to uh, look at here. Oh, yes? I have an announcement. Go ahead. This morning, our opening procession on him, as the children and our adults are processing with the palm, you will be singing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. It will be indicated up on the screen, but I wanted to make sure you did that. Well, at least we're singing verse 3. Usually verse 3 is the one that gets left out. <laughs> uh, one other announcement. Cindy Rose from the SPRC would like to stand and make an announcement. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm here this morning to talk to you about your staff parish relations committee and to make you aware of the fact that the purpose of the committee is to provide leadership and manage personnel matters of our pastor and our staff. 
Um, our focus is to build strong relationships between the pastor, the staff, and the congregation. And we are asked to assist the pastor and staff with moving the church forward to accomplish our mission of making disciples of Christ who will transform our world. We have three primary responsibilities. First is the administrative tasks related to our pastor and staff. We certainly want to pro provide the support and tend to the personnel matters that are required for that. We also want to maintain uh, the contact with the district superintendent. And lastly, we want to assist with communication between the pastor, the staff, and our congregation. In order to build these relationships, each staff member has one or two um, committee members who are serving as their advocate. And these advocates uh, connect with the staff on a regular basis to see how things are going and assure that opportunities for the staff to share their ideas and joys and concerns are given. By the same token, we want you as a congregation to feel free to approach the staff's advocate or any other member of the SPRC with any concerns you may have. Um, the entire committee is listed on the um, officers and leadership um, handout that is available down at the um, Welcome Center if you haven't seen who those committee members are. You know, it's also great to hear your positive comments and your words of support. And, of course, we encourage you to share your positive comments with the pastor and the staff directly. They appreciate hearing the things that you're liking about their services. To assure all members of the congregation know about the role of the SPRC, there will be an article in next week's newsletter, hopefully, or the one following that. And um, the advocates for each staff member will be listed in that um, article. And as I stated before, our main goal is to build meaningful relationships, strengthen our church, and accomplish God's will here in our community. Thank you so much, and have a good morning. Please stand and greet each other in the name of Christ.
Please remain standing for the call to worship. Hear, O oh man, you are of dust, and to dust you shall return. But trust in the Lord your God, for God remains ever faithful. For Christ is the Lord, and Christ has conquered death. All who believe shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Throughout the church building, you will find post-it notes. Post-it notes on doors, on windows, on your pews, in the hallways, on tables, on mirrors, on the clock. Who knows where else they might pop up. Each one represents a prayer. It's all started back on Pi Day, Pi, P-I-E, prayer in everything. And it's an important aspect of our faith to pray for one another in the good, in the bad. It's part of our own discipleship to lift things up in prayer. It's part of our own disciple, discipleship, on occasion, to be prayed for. I encourage you to take the time, as you see some of these notes, to read the prayers that have been lifted up. And next week, down at the welcome desk, there will be more post-it notes. And we hope that you will consider taking time to walk around and add to the prayers of all of us that make a strong witness of our faith in God. Something to consider as we turn to him now in prayer. Almighty God, creator of all things, redeemer of all things, sustainer of all things, we come to you having lifted up our faith to be called your people. Guide us into this holy week, this week of your passion that we might feel the connection, recognize the cost, enjoy the splendor of the grace, feel the pardon, forgiveness of sins, Know the promise of salvation and everlasting life. For these are the things that reconcile us unto you, that return us closer to the image in which we were created, that likeness that is of you. 
not only let us feel this in our own hearts, let us recognize it in the hearts of others. For in this way, we truly become community. When we lift one another up in prayer, when we mourn and grieve in the loss and the challenges of life, when we celebrate and share in the victories that each one receives, when we see opportunities to hold one another into account and to be accountable to others. These are the things that Jesus called us to do. They are the things he witnessed and expressed himself in all the things that he did. They were not just moments in time. They were the whole of a life lived. Help us in his example to reach out to those who are lost and alone. Those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Those who need peace in their spirit. Journey with us as we journey with you to the cross. And let us do so unafraid as we lift up the prayer he taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
time. Children, please come forward for the children's story. Madness. What is it? It's a big basketball thing. It's a big basketball thing. It's a lot of tournaments and stuff going on in the month of March. And college basketball, high school basketball, the Archibald Blue Streaks, boys and girls teams made a nice tournament run, and the wrestling team had a good run, and we even had a state champion in Gavin Grimm. And uh, in college, uh, Michigan Wolverines are going to the Final Four, and I think I heard Joe Crossgrove say he was going to come with his face painted next Sunday. <laughs> Maybe not. So anyway, people getting all excited about their sports teams and, and uh, tournaments and so forth. Well, there was kind of like a March Madness that happened a couple thousand years ago, and it was called Palm Sunday. Can you tell me what Palm Sunday is? It's where we wave palms to celebrate Jesus coming. I should just let him do this story. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, people got all excited because Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. Okay? And they lined the streets and they put their coats down in front of him to create a nice path. And they were getting all excited. I want you guys to go grab a palm branch right now. Go grab a palm branch. You want to get a palm branch? You want to go get one of those? No. <laughs> you want to get one? Maybe not. OK. So people were lined along the streets like a parade for Jesus to come by on this donkey. And they're waving their branches. And they're hollering, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Can you do that? Wave them. Say, Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Wave them. That's it. Hooting and hollering. Okay. Well, I, well yeah, you can, you can take them with them. I'll probably say, well, <laughs> you can take it with you or put it back. Anyway, three days after that happened, they crucified Jesus. They put him up on a cross like that, and they nailed his hands, and he died. But he died for us. He died for our sins. Yep, nails all over, huh? And he died for us. But that was so that we could live with him in heaven forever when our time on earth is done. Okay? So people got all excited about that, and that's what Palm Sunday a long time ago. And that's where we're at today. We're celebrating Palm Sunday. Okay? So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Palm Sunday and for Jesus and for his death on the cross so that we might have life with him forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Scripture reading is found in Mark chapter 11, 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the name, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills whence cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grant a blessing on this time spent that the words spoken, words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, they will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Palm Sunday. We've gone through this routine a couple of times now. It's the same story every single year. Doesn't matter which gospel you read it from. One says a donkey. One says a colt. Outside of that, there's really nothing different. First year I was here, we talked about the false victory aspect. That gets preached quite a bit. Waving our palms on Sunday, calling for crucifixion on Friday. False victory in between. Last year, pointed out the difference between being a palm waver or a donkey fetcher better to be a donkey fetcher. What else is there to say? Actually, there's a few other things, but I wanted to approach it a little bit differently this time. Who watches the TV show, This Is Us? Goodness, number one TV show and there's only a handful, that's okay turned out to be one of my favorite shows. The very first pilot episode starts out telling the story of four people all on their 39th birthday. There's a couple. They're about to have triplets. There's a set of twins, brother and sister. There's a young black man very successful. And it goes with each of them individually how they're celebrating their 39th birthday. But right at the end, suddenly it's like the camera pulls out to the big picture and you have this realization that the story of the couple in 1980. The story of the three young adults is in current day. The couple are the natural parents of the twins. The third of the triplets was lost in childbirth. 
young black man was adopted out of the, the hospital by the couple, and it's one family. And it continues to span back and forth between the couple and the kids growing up at various stages and what's happening in their current lives. And it is amazing tapestry of storytelling. The producer did an interview not too long ago. He said he didn't really know how long this show could keep going. He figured actually it could go on forever. Because in the way that they're doing the show, they can focus in on one person's viewpoint, which will always be different than another person's viewpoint. And they could tell each individual character's story after story after story. And it dawns on me that that's how Scripture works. Have you ever gone to the same passage over and over on occasion and it seems like someone came in and rewrote it while you were gone? The Holy Spirit brings you a different viewpoint. I talk about it as looking at Scripture with different eyes. The eyes of one viewpoint as to another. So, here we go with today's. We get the idea of false victory, right? We get the idea of donkey waver or donkey fetchers as opposed to palm wavers. We understand that Palm Sunday is a strange celebration. But here's the first question of the day. Jesus sent the disciples to go get the donkey. If Palm Sunday was such a negative action, the celebration, the wrong celebration of the arrival of a king as opposed to recognizing a savior. Why did Jesus send the disciples to go get the donkey? Doesn't that stop you for just a moment? Here's what I want you to do. Turn to the four or five people in the pews before and behind you and gather close together and consider the question, why did he do that? No one's moving. (laughs) Turn to the four or five people around you And consider the question, why did he do that? We admit it, we're stumped up in the front. Who's figured it out? Okay, Matt's figured it out. Matt, tell us what the answer is. Stand up, loud voice. Here, here, let's let's grab the, the magic. There you go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. There we go. Well, our thought was the donkey is sort of a peaceful symbol, right? And the donkey was supposed to be in stark contrast to the soldiers who ride in on horses, war horses. And to me, it also parallels the nativity story when the, the donkey in and anyway that's all I got I, I think that, that's interesting good answer good answer 
So, so potentially, and, and that's, that's used a lot in Scripture. Bookends. Uh, in, we call them inclusios in proper theological talk, where you have something, an event or a phrase that is exactly the same at one end of a story as the other end. And it's meant to amplify everything in between. So that's really good. There's an inclusio aspect to it. Anyone come up with a different idea? What were we doing? Talking about March Madness instead? Okay. Well, we were discussing how he, the disciples was sent to get the donkey so Jesus wouldn't have to, so they bring him back. They ride, he rides into Jerusalem, and it's more of a submissive to the cross for us. Okay. Okay. So, so recognizing that, again, as is both pointing out that a donkey is more of a submissive an animal, uh, a, a more humble animal, and, and that that really uh, showed while he walked in with some knowledge of what he was walking into or, or riding into, um, he was doing it more of a, as an act of submission in the face of the adoration that was presented. That's a, that's a good answer. Okay, a little bit further back. All right. But a cult that has never been ridden is not submissive. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly we have a whole different image of it, right? The bucking bronco into... <laughs> age of the cult can be taken into that the young can carry a burden, can carry the weight of the world. Okay. Isaiah, a child shall lead them. There's, a, there's an interesting aspect there. How about this? No? How about the back row, the wisdom of the back row? No? Okay. I think it's an interesting question. I think it, it, it takes everything, like everything else that we do in Scripture, takes the whole thing as we know it, as we've heard it preached year after year after year, and flips it on its head. Because there's a place where Jesus is complicit in setting us up, if you will, with what happened. Well, that, you guys had that? that? That was one that you... <laughs> so I think he just he knew what he was there to do and he knew that this would uh, anger the, the uh, Pharisees and those in, 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 in power and he did it to start things in motion which kind of leads us to the second question <clears throat> connects the front end of the week to the back end of the week. It's also the title of the sermon. We start on Sunday. As Dick so rightly pointed out to the children. On Sunday, praising, worshiping, singing the honor of a king entering Jerusalem. And Thursday night, He's arrested. Friday morning, he's tried and convicted and sentenced to death and hung on a cross. What happened that is so different from Sunday to Thursday? How did we change so radically? from one end of the week to the midpoint of the same week. Again, you're saying groups. Think about that question. I'll be back for an answer. (laughs) 
Okay. Our best answer coming from the front had to do with the idea that sometimes it only takes a couple of bad apples to spoil the whole barrel. What do you think? Who's got a good answer? What changed? Well, Jesus went in as, as we, we, we don't tend to think of Jesus as a, as a, we want to see him as a little white picture here on the wall. For he was a tough Jew. He'd walked all over the country. He had a bunch of bums running with him. Shoot, those guys left their fathers. And then he comes into the temple during one of the holiest periods they have, whips the money changers, tips over the tables, goes out and runs off the guys that are killing the sheep, and upsets the establishment badly. And these old boys in their, the, the, in their offices looking down at him and him saying, you den of vipers, you just as well be in the cemetery. You aren't doing what you preach. And they didn't like it. And like you say, the crowd got with him, and off he went. So he upset the apple cart so much uh, in just a couple of days, the whole city turned against him. At least the leaders did, and they got the people to go with them. We all got that one? That sound, I see a lot of nodding heads. Is that what we, oh, we got a different idea up front? Oh, we're searching the scriptures. <laughs> well, I think what we see is a huge transition in uh, the week or so that whatever the number of days were from the time that he came in, in a, as a humble person. I mean, when you compare it to the Roman soldiers with their huge horses, uh, I defer to Dale Lou on horses, but you know it's a, you know it's definitely a humility aspect. Mm -hmm. But then changing from uh, Peter not truly understanding what was ahead, where he was trying to protect Jesus because he knew he was walking into a mm -hmm. nightmare here for uh, getting killed, and Jesus rebuked him and mm -hmm. told him, you know, this isn't you're you're looking at things on a human level. And I'm looking at things on a spiritual level. So I see a, a huge transition with the disciples not quite understanding the bigger picture that was ahead. And uh, I'm not sure what changed in a week, but for those disciples, it must have been mind-bending for them to actually realize what he was walking into. Mm -hmm. We didn't focus necessarily on Jesus. I mean, we did, but we talked about fear and group think the the israelites the the jews those who lived in jerusalem were afraid of the romans so when jesus came in and they saw him as their savior in an earthly sense they jumped on the bandwagon one person jumped in so everybody did because they're gonna that group think it takes over so everybody just follows along and then the pharisees held all the power they knew that they were also afraid of the pharisees when the pharisees said he's bad they jumped on that bandwagon Nobody stopped to think what had happened four days ago out of fear for themselves and watching a couple people jump in and say, yep, you're right, he must be bad. They went along with it. And um, Carlin actually pointed out, we see that today. It happens currently. People flip-flop, and they don't look and see what's right or wrong. They go with the majority. They go with the group just because it's happening. So. Anyone else? Uh, we focused on God, allowed Judas to be entered by Satan, and because God wanted to change it since Adam and Eve, God wanted to get it back to the people, back to him, and so he sent his son to be the sacrificial lamb. Anyone else? I think we hit on some really good ones there. I think the two go together. I think that Palm Sunday is a total setup. 
put us right in the position of what we need most. We have expectations. We have huge expectations. And more times than not, our expectations have to do with me. Me. There was a great performance yesterday at the barber shop where the lead singer of the men's group said, it's all about <coughs> And they were jostling to get to the front of the mic, but for the lead singer, he said, obviously, the lead singer, it's all about the lead singer. It might be for people, but it's really only about <coughs> And that's how we act. That's our human nature. So Palm Sunday happens. And Jesus goes into Jerusalem knowing what's ahead of him. Kim is exactly right. Missed the timing by just a little bit. It's just a week before Palm Sunday or so that we get the Bethany encounter and and. Peter saying, you are the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus saying, son of God must go and die. And he says, no, it can't be that. And Jesus rebukes him. Jesus knew before he went. The trip to Bethany is to go and raise Lazarus. And they know they're going to Jerusalem. And the disciples know that if he goes into Jerusalem, he will be arrested and they will try and kill him. And they're doing everything they can to stop him from going to Jerusalem for the Passover. That whole trip. But Jesus knew why he was going and what he was going for. What changed? Guys got it. Pharisees were trying to kill Jesus, not just in that week. Jesus only exasperated it more with everything he did there in Jerusalem between Sunday and Friday. They had laid plans to try and catch him and arrest him for anything they could get their hands on him for. Almost from the beginning of his ministry. That's why they always had somebody present every time he was teaching, trying to catch him at something. The Pharisees didn't need Judas, they knew who Jesus was, but they needed a betrayer from the inner circle to seal the deal. They needed someone from the inner circle to help sway the outer crowd from the entrance of Sunday to call for crucifixion on Friday. And here's the punchline of the whole story. We are all on a faith journey individually, but also as a humankind. We know, we know, I've talked to some of you who have said, thank God I wasn't there because I'd be in that crowd. We know that that's our story. It's our faith journey. If we had been in Jerusalem that day, we'd have been right next to them waving the palms. And we'd have been right next to them Friday calling, crucify him, crucify him. And in knowing that, we come to a point of realization in God's plan. From our greatest shame comes our salvation. From our greatest shame comes our salvation.
We are only saved by the death and resurrection of Christ. And the power is that we all are complicit in how our Savior is put on the cross. As we enter into this Holy Week, let us feel those places where the emotions of this moment hit us and transform us and carry us forward in our faith journey. But let us also get to the resurrection. Judas's greatest failing was he didn't wait until Sunday. Even as Jesus blessed and forgave those who crucified him, he would have blessed and forgave Judas. And in the same way, he blesses and forgives each and every one of us. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward at this time? Reminder to tear off your response forms in your bulletin and place them in the offering plate. Please. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for caring for us and for entrusting to us the ministry of caring for one another. May our tithes and offerings both honor you and extend our influence beyond our own reach, we pray. Amen.
In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt is our believing, in our lives eternity, in our death a resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed. Until its season, something God alone can see. Go in peace. Amen.